the textbooks that we're using in this course are two. The first is this dialogue called A Muslim and a Christian in Dialogue by Badu Katarega and myself, David Schenk. Like I mentioned earlier, this dialogue is intended to build understanding. Um, in Iran, they translated it into Iranian, and then they, the Iranian Muslims did, and have conversations together about their, under, their, their different understandings of faith for the purpose of building understanding. And so you will see uh, in the uh, topical outline that for topic three, uh, which is called the early theological formation in the Arabian background, that the uh, chapters that should be read for that are chapters one and two in this book, Journeys. And we have the Russian translation of that book here. So by tomorrow, I would encourage you to read chapters one and two. This will cover what we have said in the lecture, but with greater depth than was possible in the lecture. So chapters one and two. And for people taking the course for academic credit, you will notice that there is an assignment. Whenever you read a chapter in this book, Journeys, there are questions at the end of each chapter. And you are expected to write a one-page essay concerning one of the questions at the end of the chapter. For example, chapter, um, chapter 2 has eight questions at the end of chapter 2. So you would select one of those eight questions and write a one-page essay in regards to one of those eight questions that you would choose. That's, that's the suggested approach. OK? Any questions about that? So now, we go to topic four, the Muslim uh, community. And you will notice that for topic four, we are encouraging you to read from the dialogue. Chapters one and eight, those are the two chapters on God. Chapters one and eight. Yeah, chapter one and eight. Chapter one is uh, there's no God but Allah. Chapter eight is the Ummah. And then chapter 13 is the Christian side. God is one. And chapter 18, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 21 is the church. So those are parallel chapters. So that's the recommendation that, that you would read them. So uh, we're looking now at the Muslim uh, community, the Ummah. Uh, Muhammad was born in 570 AD. Uh, into a family that traced their lineage back to Abraham and Ishmael. In 610, uh, Muhammad claimed that he began to receive revelations through Gabriel. Uh, he was uh, in a uh, cave outside of Mecca, and uh, he claims that uh, this uh, being appeared to him and, and surprised him greatly. Um, uh, the, uh, the message that, he, uh, that, that Gabriel came to him with uh, is recorded here in the Quran, that, um, chapter 96. We read, read or proclaim in the name of your Lord and cherisher who created, created man out of a mere clot of congealed blood. Proclaim, and your Lord is most bountiful. He who taught the use of the pen taught man that which he did not know. That surah, chapter, the first part of chapter 96, Muslims believe is the first word of revelation brought by Gabriel to Muhammad. And the first word is recite or proclaim, which means Quran. So the name Quran is the first word of revelation, Muslims believe. And then the other elaboration, you know, in the name of your Lord and cherish who created, created man, uh, proclaim your Lord is most bountiful, taught the use of the pen, which is amazing that we have learned how to read and write. And uh, that is built right into this early revelation, this amazement, the gift of reading and writing. So they believe that is the first word of revelation. Up to this point, Muhammad had been a merchant. Uh, he, he was actually an orphan boy, born as an orphan. Uh, his, his, uh, his father died even before he was born. And his mother, when he was uh, just a, a, a young child, so he was raised by his grandfather, his uncle, and so forth. And, um, and uh, then, as a young man, was employed by Khadija, a rich, a rich, a rich merchant. And, and then he later on married her. And so in, in his uh, merchant work, he would travel extensively to Syria and so forth with the camel caravans. So he was not just a local. He had a, 
a perspective beyond Arabia through his travels. And uh, he was given to contemplation and out there on the mount, and in a cave on Mount Hira outside of Mecca, he claimed that Gabriel came and taught him this word of revelation. That was the first word of revelation for the next 22 years. These words of revelation would come occasionally. Now, the people of Mecca on the whole rejected his, 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 his message. And in fact, his life was under threat. And so in the year 622, he migrates from Mecca to Medina. We'll talk more about that later on. And there in Medina, he was now able to establish the Muslim community with the mechanisms of political and military power. And then eight years later, he returned to Mecca, leading 10,000 troops. Mecca has been defeated in the wars between the Muslims and the Meccans, and they sue for peace. And so he enters Mecca now as a statesman and a prophet, and he is able to establish Islam now within Mecca as well. And so by the time of his death, in 632 AD, all of Arabia had come under the rule of the Muslims. So that's basically a, histor a very brief historical sketch, which we will be revisiting in various ways in our next several days together, and looking at the theology that forms, or that was formed, as these historical developments emerged. Now, this Muslim community um, is part of the communities of faith that trace their origin to Abraham. Remember that uh, in the Bible, in the Torah, when Abraham um, um, receives the call from God, chapter 12 of, of Genesis, the Lord said to Abraham, leave your country, your people, and your father's household. Go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham left, as the Lord told him. <laughs> that leaving from the world of polytheism. I mean, Abraham's people were polytheists, you see. He came from Iraq. It was, it was a polytheistic area and region. And God calls him, leave all that rubbish and begin to follow me, the creator of the heavens and the earth, God Almighty. And I will bless you and make you to be a blessing to all nations, you see. And that's, that's the missionary vision of the Abrahamic faiths, to be a blessing to all nations. Now, what are these Abrahamic faiths? What are these faiths that trace their origin back to Abraham? What's the first one? The first faith that traces its origins to Abraham. Judaism. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, the Israel. Exactly right. Israel. Mm -hmm. So Abraham is called to leave, and he'll become a blessing to all nations. And Israel is, lives within that heritage and within that mission, you see, um, to be a blessing to all nations and to leave the world of polytheism, to be a people of righteousness and justice the true seed of Abraham. Then comes the church. And the church views itself also as a fulfillment of that mission. And the church's roots are within Israel. And also, we see ourselves as an Abrahamic movement, you see. We're part of the family of Abraham. Um, uh, the faith of Abraham, we hope, we seek to embrace as our faith likewise, you see. And so this is also an Abrahamic movement, you see. And then the third movement, of course, is the Muslim movement. And the Muslim movement, again, traces itself back to Abraham. And uh, like we said earlier today, uh, certainly sees itself as a fulfillment, a continuation, a fulfillment of what Israel is to be about. Um, this Yusuf Ali, the, who's, who's called on, uh, I, I use in one of his commentaries, says how that, the Muslim movement rounds out and fulfills the mission of, of, of Israel, you see. It's in continuity with, but it now supersedes and fulfills the mission of Israel. And so you have the Muslim Ummah, which means the, the community, the Muslim community. And so, and the Muslim Ummah, as we said earlier, um, has connections with the church, and with Israel, and with Abraham. Um, 
And again, it would see itself as the fulfillment of what the church is about, what Israel's about. Uh, the Muslim Ummah would see that and would see Muhammad as standing in the spiritual line of, of Abraham as the, as, a, as, as the Quran says, an imam over the nations, a prophet, the final prophet who is, has a mission over the nations to bring God's truth to the nations and, um, and to bless the nations with that truth. Yes? What are the Muslims things the Christian church is doing? What's their purpose? If they kind of somehow respect the church, respect the people of the book, how do you in the whole this theological world, what, who are the Christians? They're not polytheists, they're not pagans, they're something. So what's their job supposed to be? What's their existence for? I mean? Well, I think Muslims would feel that the church's fullest uh, completion would be to become Muslim because Islam is the final clarification. And so the church lives... Um, without having yet embraced that clarification. Yeah, yeah. But they're not polities, they're, they're different. No, 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 they're, they're closest to Muslims in the faith, says the Quran, yeah. Although, as, as, as we know, our Trinitarian theology sometimes gives them pause. And some would say, you really are very close to polytheism. Um, and um, so there's, there's, there's some ambivalence, I would say. Uh, I experienced in my walk with Muslims. Um, like in those dialogues in the United Kingdom, this Shabra Ali that was dialoguing with me, he says, David, you're my very best friend, the Quran says so. On the other hand, the Quran says, be careful because David might deceive you. And Islam is the final faith, he hasn't accepted that. So be careful. <laughs> Who do you think the close to the Muslim, the church or Jude Judaism? Church. Well, yeah, a very good question. It'd be good to ask a Muslim that question. I think Judaism. Also. I think it's closer. However, I say that cautiously because Islam has accepted that Jesus is the Messiah and Judaism has not accepted that. And so there's a, there's a huge difference there. Although, like we said, the understanding of what Messiah means in Islam is not uh, the fullness of the understanding in the New Testament. But still, when someone says Jesus is the Messiah, you open the door to possibilities that the Jews have not opened the, the door for. But, I mean, but this is from kind of our side, but from Muslim side, Here's the church and here's the Jewish, and the Jewish a little closer toward the Muslim, then they all should become the Muslim in their mind, if I realize, right? But who are the closer to become the Muslims? Jewish or the church, or they say? You know, the formation of the state of Israel has, has been very transformational. And uh, the Muslim community as a whole, I think, feels that the Jewish state of Israel is based upon injustice. And so, um, that, that, I think, distorts the understanding of Judaism quite a bit. And um, for that reason, probably, they would say we're closer to the Christians. I think so. And also the Messianic thing. I think that's very real. That Jesus is the Messiah. Muslims believe that. Jews don't. And there, at, that le at that level, there's, there's a convergence that, we don't, that they don't have with Jews. You know. But like we said earlier today, much of, of Islam is really uh, so similar to Judaism um, that um, the Torah and, the, and, and the, the place of the Torah and the place of the Talmud and all of that sort of thing. And as Christians, we don't have those kinds of constructs. So in reality, in terms of practice, Judaism and Islam are very close together. Yeah. Good questions. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TFS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, visit www.tvseminary.com. So these three faiths now are missionary faiths, and especially Islam and Christianity. Both are called to bear witness. I was having a dialogue with Katarega just a year ago in Somaliland. And when we got onto this, that both communities are called to bear witness, Katarega says, not just bear witness, as Muslims were called to urgently invite. And he was pointing out, as I did earlier today, whenever the prayer call is given, we proclaim our faith and then we say with urgency, come. Experience well-being, you see. Well, the church is also called to bear witness and with urgency invite, you see. 
And it's so important that Muslims and Christians <laughs> find ways to respectfully recognize that both communities are called to bear witness. I was in, um, in the Philippines a couple years ago, about a little over a year ago, and uh, was in a Muslim village where um, our church has a, um, the Mennonite church has a, um, a volunteer working. And uh, we were having dinner in the, in the home of the Soldan. And he was explaining how he is the great, 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 great grandfather, the first Soldan to come to the Philippines. Obviously a man of great stature in, um, in Mindanao there in the southern Philippines. And uh, he said, we're very happy that, you, that your people have come to serve among us. We welcome them. But we have a question to ask you. Do you perchance hope that uh, one of us would become a Christian or some of us become Christians? If you have that hope, go home. We don't want you at all because that is religious imperialism. We want nothing to do with it. So I said, may I respond? He said, yes. I said, we are here because we are your guests and you have invited us to come. If you do not invite us to come, of course, we cannot stay. But you've invited us to come. And... As we serve among you, we seek to serve as disciples of Jesus. People believe in Jesus, are committed to Jesus, and Jesus serves. He washes the feet of others, as it were. And we seek also to serve in that same spirit. And as we serve in that spirit, sometimes it happens. that people come and they say they also want to follow Jesus as we follow him. If we would say no, wouldn't that be cultural imperialism? You see, isn't the door open for people to believe if they wish? I said, sometimes Muslims have come to me, a couple times this has happened in my lifetime, where they have come and embraced me and even wept on my shoulder and said, oh, David, please become a Muslim. You're too good a man to be a Christian. I don't consider that as cultural imperialism at all, but as compassion born out of their faith, you see. And so if as Christians we yearn that people become followers of Jesus, that's not religious imperialism. It comes out of the heart of our faith, you see. We need to respect that each of us are called to bear witness and to deny someone the possibility of believing in Jesus if he wants to believe in Jesus because he sees the witness of our life and ministry. Uh, wouldn't that be cultural imperialism? And the old soul said, he looked at me and said, yes, that would be imperialism. <laughs> we are free. We are free, you see. So in various ways, as we work with Muslims, we address that question of being called to bear witness. And... Um, in humility, we need to each respect uh, that each one, both the Muslims and the Christians, believe they have a calling to bear witness, to bear witness. And that witness preeminently means to live as a blessing to others. Abraham was a blessing to all nations. I was with a group of Muslims in, uh, in, in, in the Gambia recently, and they went through the town saying, Daoud Sheikh is in town, Daoud Sheikh is in town. And he loves Muslims. He, comes, he was born in, Afri in East Africa, the other side of the continent, thousands of miles away. But now he's with us today. He loves Muslims. So come to the big tree in the center of the town, and we'll have conversation in the afternoon. And so I went to the big tree, and quite a large group came together, including the imam from the mosque. And so I said, thank you for coming. Now I said, I am committed to the faith of Abraham. And you are too, right? Yes, 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 that's right. I said, now to be... Committed to the faith of Abraham means we should bless one another. So let's just talk. How are the Christians blessing you Muslims in this town? And how do you Muslims bless the Christians? And we had a wonderful several hours together. <laughs> and the imam, as he got up to leave, he says, come and have more talks. So I went to his house and had a nice further talk with him about all of that, uh, which is so important. That's a starting point. We're called to bless one another. Are we blessing each other? How can we live in a way that blesses one another? <laughs> <laughs> so that's the beginning of the Muslim community. Now, Muslims believe that, um, that, um, that Adam is the first Muslim prophet. So Adam is the first. They believe when Adam was created, God sent Islam down to him, which is instruction on what you should believe and what you should do. So Adam is the first prophet, which means Islam is the first primary, the, the primal religion of humankind. It is the first religion of humankind, which brothers and sisters means that all of us are born naturally Muslim. If you perchance are a Baptist or something like that, 
it means that someone has deceived you along the way. That your natural inclination would be to become Muslim as Adam was a Muslim. That's the natural religion of humankind. It's the first religion of humankind. So Muslims never like, us, like it when we say that, that Muhammad brought Islam. See, no, 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 no. He simply revived Islam. But Adam was the first Muslim. We'll talk more about that later on. But it is to say, it is to say that Islam is the primal religion of humankind. And then they believe that down the line, oh, and by the way, Adam developed the first house of God at the black stone. When he came from heaven, he found the black stone where Mecca is today, and so he built the first Kaaba. So not only is he the first Muslim, but he built the first Kaaba, the first temple of God on earth. He built right there over that black stone. Now, many years later, along comes Abraham. And Abraham was also a Muslim, they believe, and that he and Ishmael went to uh, Mecca together to, 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 to where the Kaaba had been, and it was destroyed. The Kaaba had been destroyed. But they found the, the black stone, Ishmael and Abraham. And so Abra Abraham and Ishmael rebuilt the Kaaba, which Adam had first built, you see. So Abraham and Ishmael, they are the middle prophets of Islam. So get it? Islam is the first religion of humankind, and it is also the middle religion of humankind. So Islam is the first and the middle religion. Adam is the first prophet, and who's the middle prophet? Abraham, you see. Why is he the first, the middle prophet? Ah, he reestablishes the faith of Islam in a polytheistic world. He goes to the Kaaba. He rebuilds the Kaaba there at the Black Stone with his son Ishmael. They did that together. Question. It's from Quran or interpretation of Quran? This information about Adam. Oh, th this, this would be, this would be an interpretation of the Quran. Okay. But it, it's, it's completely Quranic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that story would be just kind of like interpreted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The story about Adam and Quran. Yeah, he is the first Muslim. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's very clear. Yeah. And now, uh, the third, the final prophet then, is Muhammad. Muhammad. So Muhammad does what, what uh, Abraham had done, and what Adam had done. He goes to the black stone, he cleanses it of all the polytheistic rubbish and so forth, and he, and he reestablishes the faith of Islam at the black stone there at the Kaaba, you see. And, uh, and so, uh, the first religion of humankind is Islam, and who is the first prophet? Adam. The middle religion of humankind is Islam, and who establishes it? Abraham. And the final religion is Muhammad. So Islam is both the first, middle, and final religion of, hu religion of humankind, without change, without change. The Islam that God revealed to Abraham or to Muhammad is the same that he revealed to Adam. It's simply that Muhammad further clarified the Islam that God revealed to Muhammad, uh, to, to Adam, without change, you see. So Islam is always the same. <laughs> what is it? It's instruction on what you should do and what you should believe. That's what Islam is. And that's what the Quran is. It's the final clarification of that instruction. And the Muslim Ummah is the community that is committed to embracing that Quran as its center. Yeah. But the Quran is not new. It's simply a reaffirmation of the faith that God revealed to Adam, the first primal prophet. So if you follow your natural inclinations, what religion will you embrace? Islam, according to Muslims. Okay, time to break. Adam is the first prophet, and who's the middle prophet? Abraham, you see? Why is he the first, the middle prophet? Ah, he reestablishes the faith of Islam in a polytheistic world. He goes to the Kaaba. He rebuilds the Kaaba there at the Black Stone with his son Ishmael. They did that together. Question. It's from Quran or interpretation of Quran? This information about Adam. Oh, th this, this would be, this would be an interpretation of the Quran. Okay. But it, it's, it's completely Quranic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that story would be just kind of like interpreted. Mm -hmm. The yeah. story about Adam and Quran. Yeah, he is the first Muslim. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's very clear. Yeah. And now, uh, the third, the final prophet then, is Muhammad. Muhammad. 
So Muhammad does what, what uh, Abraham had done and what Adam had done. He goes to the black stone, he cleanses it of all the polytheistic rubbish and so forth, and he, and he reestablishes the faith of Islam at the black stone there at the Kaaba, you see. And, uh, and so uh, the first religion of humankind is Islam, and who's the first prophet? Adam. The middle religion of humankind is Islam, and who establishes it? Abraham. And the final religion is Muhammad. So Islam is both the first, middle, and final religion of, hu religion of humankind without change, without change. The Islam that God revealed to Abraham or to Muhammad is the same that he revealed to Adam. It's simply that Muhammad further clarified the Islam that God revealed to Muhammad, uh, to, to Adam, without change, you see. So Islam is always the same. <laughs> what is it? It's instruction on what you should do and what you should believe. That's what Islam is. And that's what the Quran is. It's the final clarification of that instruction. And the Muslim Ummah is the community that is committed to embracing that Quran as its center. Yeah. But the Quran is not new. It's simply a reaffirmation of the faith that God revealed to Adam, the first primal prophet. So if you follow your natural inclinations, what religion will you embrace? Islam, according to Muslims. Okay, time to break. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.